Jude chapter 1, verses 3 through 4, New King James Version reads it like this. Beloved, while I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation, I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith which was once for all delivered to the saints. For certain men have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were marked out for this condemnation, ungodly men, who turn the grace of our God into lewdness and deny the only Lord God and our Lord, Jesus Christ. So tonight I want to, as I said, kind of start an introduction to something we'll focus in on more specifically in the future. But tonight I want to start the introduction that I want to title Apostolic Approach. Apostolic Approach. Uh, let's pray and ask the Lord to speak to us tonight. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth that your word reveals. And we ask tonight that as we begin to explore some of these foundational truths, that you would illuminate our heart and mind with your word, that your spirit would bear witness to it, we ask tonight. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Uh, basic truths of Scripture are both obvious and obscure. Uh, it's something that is as plain as the nose on your face, except for um, you got to look for it. Even though it's as obvious as can be, uh, the truths of Scripture are written in plain sight, but yet obscure at the same time, meaning you're probably not going to see them if you're not looking for them. Uh, it's, it's kind of interesting like that. The truths of the Word of God are revealed to the hungry soul, not the person who doesn't really care, not the person who's more focused on man's creeds than God's truths. And so with that in mind, uh, it's this unique uh, observation. And to keep in mind, uh, as we begin this study tonight, that there is this common factor throughout the New Testament that is found both through statement and conclusion. It's something that is emphatically revealed, as well as we can draw these conclusions uh, through the principles and teachings of Scripture. And so Paul says it like this in Galatians 3, verse 3. Are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now made perfect by the flesh? I'm reminded of the fate of the racehorse war emblem when I read this verse. In his attempt to win the Triple Crown, uh, we find in the story that horses and their jockeys are lined up at the gate. And the tension is building for the moment that they would launch into the race. And finally it came. And there was a violent explosion of dust, snorts, and speed as the horses and their jockeys launch into this mile and a half race. However, one thing happened at the beginning that determined the outcome. From the very beginning, the end was determined. And this was it. War emblem stumbled. He raced the mile and a half course, but he didn't win. And so in the words of his trainer, Bob Baffert, it was lost at the start. It matters how you start. How you start determines how you'll finish. Now, that statement may disagree with a lot of faith preaching, meaning the blood of Jesus, the power of God, uh, the Spirit of God can take any life and turn it around. That is true. But I'm talking about from the moment you enter into the kingdom of God, there's only one way to enter. There's only one way to be born again. There's only one truth in this word of God. There's not your truth, my truth, and uh, person number three's truth, and they're all, we all have different versions there's not many different roads to heaven. There's not many different uh, paths and belief systems 
that lead to the same God. So how you start determines how you'll finish. Yes, we know that Jesus can find any person, whether they're rich or poor, uh, they have their life together uh, morally, but they still need a savior or they're the most immoral person on the face of the earth. We know that Jesus can find anybody where they are and transform their life. But we're talking about from the moment Jesus begins to deal with a person to the moment they're in eternity with him, how you start that part of your life determines how you end it. And so uh, that all of that will make a little bit more sense uh, in a moment and uh, should make perfect sense uh, by the time we're done here tonight. It matters how you start. This is the focal point of the New Testament and really all of Scripture, but because we are the church and the church uh, began in Acts chapter 2. We see the, uh, the birth of the church in Acts chapter 2. I am focusing specifically on these things tonight. Remember, it's an introduction to a concept we'll teach more in depth in the future. So this is the focal point of the New Testament. How you begin is how you should end. If you begin in the Spirit, you should be perfected, as Paul says, or completed in the Spirit. You can't start in the Spirit and Jesus has saved you from your sins, you're in the kingdom of God, and now you can do it however you want because the blood of Jesus is powerful enough for anything. No, if you needed Jesus to start, you need Jesus to finish. So if you begin in the Spirit, you also must be completed or perfected in the Spirit. Don't change course or commitment after the fact. Don't become less committed the longer you live for God. That, that literally makes no sense. If you prayed passionately in the beginning, you should pray more passionately now that you've been living for God 10, 15, 20, 30, 50 years. Uh, these are just basic common sense statements that uh, we know are true. Uh, if you loved Jesus with your whole being the first year you were a Christian, you should love Jesus with even more of your whole being 30 years later. Uh, it's just common sense. You need to start right to finish right. And how you started is how you should continue. Because remember, the way matters. So we open up with our text in Jude, and he says to contend, fight, struggle, uh, stand up for earnestly the faith, the faith, not a faith, the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. The faith in the beginning was for all people for all time, and that faith that was uh, delivered to the saints in the beginning, that's the same faith you and I need to have, the same set of beliefs you and I need to have, the same truths we need to live by, adhere to, and believe with our whole being today. And we got to fight for it. We got to defend it. We got to stick up for it because um, there will be people that will seek to change it. So this faith that was delivered, where was it delivered? When was it delivered? At the beginning. And that's obviously a good place to start. So as we get into some of this, uh, what is apostolic approach? It's very simple. We go back to the beginning. We see how things started. That's the purest form at the beginning. And so apostolic approach uh, is what I'm titling tonight, and it is something that we need to have in our mindset that anything I believe, I'm going back to the beginning. And where would the best place to start be? In the Bible. So uh, Hebrews 6, 1 through 2 kind of talks about this a little bit. Where it says, therefore, 
leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of the doctrine of baptisms, of laying on of hands, of resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. These things mentioned in these two verses are what the writer of Hebrews uh, says are elementary principles of Christ. Elementary. They're basic. They're foundational. So, some more common sense here. Uh, do you go to elementary school before or after you go to high school? Like, obviously before. Why? Elementary, that is the beginning of your uh, schooling season of life. Elementary, middle school, high school, college, university, then you get into graduate studies, then you can get into doctoral studies, and it's this progression. But elementary comes first. Why? Because there are things that we learn in our elementary grades in school that are the foundational teachings, facts, and principles that we need to know before we can learn all the other fancy stuff, before we can learn all the other deep knowledge and explore uh, what type of a knowledge path we want to take in our life and what kind of studies we want to get into that will help determine the course of our life. Bottom line is one plus zero equals one, no matter what graduate program you're in. It doesn't change. And where did you learn that? elementary school. So now the writer of Hebrews is saying at some point you've got to leave these elementary principles, leave the discussion of them, not the fact that we ignore them, deny them, and they no longer apply, but at some point the foundation is built and now it's time to be built up into more. It's time to take the next step because the elementary principles, the foundational principles have been established and those just don't change. And so that's what the writer of Hebrews is talking about. And some of those elementary principles are the repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, you have water baptism. And then John the Baptist says that Jesus will baptize us with the Holy Ghost and with fire. We have the laying on of hands. We have the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. These are just things that are, they don't change. And um, they're the basis of everything we are in what we believe as the church. They're foundational. One of the foundational truths that um, I want to talk about tonight is what the Bible has to say about God. And most specifically in this setting, Jesus. Who was he? Well, John 1.1 1, 1, and going on through verse 5, the John, the author of the gospel of John, uh, starts at the beginning. <clears throat> and he says, in the beginning was the word. Now, he starts his gospel echoing the beginning of our Bible. In Genesis 1, in the beginning God created, and he writes in John 1, in the beginning was the Word. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men, and the light shined in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Now, um, John starts at the beginning to explain who Jesus is. Then he goes on in verse 14 and says, The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So what we find here so far is the begotten Son of God the man, the human, Jesus Christ, is the glory of the Father or the Creator. They're synonymous. Father and Creator are synonymous. So when we look at God, God is describing um, the, the being of the Creator. The Creator is God, the Almighty, Supreme God. 
That's what he is. Just like you and I are human beings, that's what we are. God is what the creator is. And he is the father of all creation because all living things come from him. And the human man, Jesus Christ, is the glory, the revealed glory of the Father or the Creator. Uh, Paul says it like this in Colossians 1, Jesus is the image or the icon of the invisible God. Uh, Hebrews 1, 3 says, Who being the brightness of his glory in the express image of his person, Reading the context of Hebrews 1, starting at verse 1, going on through verse 3 and such, we read and understand that what the writer is saying is that Jesus is the exact and only image of the person of the Creator. So notice Jesus, the man Jesus Christ, is the exact and only image of the person of of the Creator. Which Jesus said in John 14, verse 9, when you've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then Paul says in 1 Timothy 3:16, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. Meaning, uh, there, there's no debate about the fact that, uh, that it is a mystery. There's no debate about it. It's a hard thing to wrap your mind around. It's a hard thing to conceive that God would become a human. It uh, is something bigger than what we can fully comprehend in the sense of to just kind of look at it and be like, yeah, you know, no big deal. I see how it happened. No, it is a phenomenon. It is something that is uh, so great and it kind of blows our mind. It's a great mystery. But Paul doesn't say, great is the mystery of godliness. Nobody can figure it out. He says this, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. Well, who's the creator? God was. So the creator was manifest in the flesh, justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, received up in the glory. These, amongst many other statements about the Godhead in the New Testament, are doctrines of the beginning. The the writings that we have read from so far are authors of New Testament scripture that are uh, of the, the people that believe in the one true God that traces back to the beginning. The Jews, the New Testament writers and the apostles were Jews who believed God the Creator was one person. And so when you say God, it's not, they never had any mindset that was three persons, co-equal and co-eternal, because the Son of God is not eternal. He's begotten. Um, and so, um, you know, we look into these things, and as I've said, this is not exhaustive tonight. So um, there's a lot more that can be taught and explained, and we will soon. But we're, we're using this as a launching pad. And so the writers of the New Testament, the apostles, they were all Jews. They believed that God the Creator was one person. So who is Jesus? Paul says, God manifest in the flesh. Who is Jesus? The writers of Hebrews says that he is the express image of the person of the creator. And that is a foundational teaching of scripture that we look at. Another uh, introduction that we want to look at tonight is baptism. What is the approach to this that we must take? Well, let's start with Hebrews 9.22. It says, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Blood has to be shed for there to be remission. The book of Hebrews is an incredible book that explains uh, the connection between the Old Testament and the New Testament and everything Jesus did. And so it's kind of like a commentary on the entire Bible. And it says, without the shedding of blood, there's no remission. 
Luke 24, 47 says that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. This is what Jesus was telling his disciples. Luke 24, 47 records that. Repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, in his name everywhere. But starting at Jerusalem. And then we read in Matthew 28, 18 through 20, Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So with this, these three verses that we've read so far, Hebrews 9, 22, Luke 24, verse 47, Matthew 28, 18 through 20, we then understand and we need to look at and consider this. The apostles' actions in the book of Acts reveal their understanding, interpretation, and implementation of everything Jesus commanded them. Remember I said at the beginning that the truths of Scripture are both obvious and obscure. You can read it. You can look at it. It doesn't take a ton of digging to see these foundational truths. But if you don't want to see them, they will be uh, just as hard to find as can be. Um, and so, let's just consider this for a moment. The apostles' actions in the book of Acts reveal their understanding, their interpretation, and their implementation of everything Jesus commanded them. So either they were right or wrong. Now, what we also have to consider is this. And there's, um, you know, a common agreement, agreeance here was that the Bible is the infallible word of God. I believe that. I assume you believe that. Uh, just about anyone under the very broad and diverse Christian umbrella today hopefully would agree that this is the infallible word of God. Well, if that's the case, you and I have to uh, agree on the fact that the book of Acts has just as much authority as Matthew or as Isaiah or as the Gospel of John. We either believe all of it or we don't. And so putting the pieces together of Scripture in reading the narrative of Scripture, we look at this and the book of Acts is in a historical account that is teaching theological truth. Because it's very commonly agreed that the way uh, people would pass on truth and information that, wanted to, that needed to be remembered is they would communicate it in story form. Uh, that's how you get Genesis. That's how they passed on truths throughout the ages. That's how Jesus taught truths that are about the kingdom of heaven, he taught parables. Well, it's the same thing with the book of Acts. It's an historical account that reveals theological truth. And in it, we find the apostles uh, uh, revealing their understanding of Jesus' teachings, their interpretation of Jesus' teachings, as well as their implementation of Jesus' teachings. And one of the big ones, one of the most infamous ones, is Acts 2.38. Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Notice that Peter says remission takes place in baptism and that the name should be invoked there the name should be jesus christ 
Hebrews 9.22 talks about blood has to be shed for there to be remission. Jesus shed his blood on the cross. Jesus said in Luke 24, repentance and remission of sin should be preached in his name. Jesus tells uh, his disciples to go make disciples, baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, and teach them to observe everything I've commanded you. We read that in Matthew 28. And then Peter gets up an emphatic statement, says that baptism in the name of Jesus Christ is where remission of sins takes place. But what we have to understand is it wasn't just Peter there that day. So Peter is infamous for that statement because he was the one talking. But Peter wasn't alone that day. He was with the other 11 apostles. Acts 2.14, right after the upper room, it says, Peter standing up with the 11, lifted up his voice and said unto them, you men of Judea and all you that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you and hearken, listen to my words. Acts 2.37 after Peter had done preaching the gospel and told them, hey, you killed the Messiah, but he's alive forever now. And they hear this and they're probably freaking out a little bit. And they say uh, to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Peter and the rest of the apostles, they were speaking to all 12. And they say, men and brethren, what shall we do? So we find here, all of them agreed. Peter was the spokesperson, but Peter also had the support of all 11 other apostles. Peter gets the credit for Acts 2.38, but the command of Acts 2.38 had the consensus of all 12 apostles. It's as obvious and plain as can be but you got to want to see it. And so, uh, you know, we find more recordings in Acts. Acts 8, 14 through 16. Philip goes and preaches in Samaria, and he does, and he baptizes people, and miracles happened, and a lot of great things were taking place, and there was joy in that city. But verse 14, we read, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Notice this, for as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Philip was baptizing in the name of Jesus Christ. All 12 apostles in Acts 2, we find it recorded that they agreed that um, you should be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. That's how those 12 apostles interpreted what Jesus said in Matthew 28, verse 19. The command was to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Philip, who was not one of the 12 apostles, but he was a deacon in the early church, so to speak, and an evangelist, and he goes and he preaches in Samaria. And how does he baptize them? In the name of Jesus Christ. Acts 10, 48. Uh, Peter goes to Cornelius' house, the Gentiles, um, which is just a people group that's not of the nation of Israel. And um, he's preaching, the Holy Ghost falls, Acts 10, 48. It says, he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Peter commanded that Cornelius' household be baptized in the name of the Lord. Well, we know that Lord is not a name. It's a title. What is the name of the Lord? Who is the Lord? Well, I'm sure all of us would agree that the Lord is Jesus. The Lord is his title. His name is Jesus. So I don't think any of us would have any debate about the fact that uh, when Peter said to be baptized in the name of the Lord, that someone would stand up and say, hey, I think there needs to be a case made for when we baptize people, I, I baptize you in the name of the Lord. I don't think, I, I've never even heard of a um, argument for that. No, because you can conclude the fact that the name of the Lord would be Jesus. So 
They baptize him in the name of Jesus. Acts 19, 4 through 5, Paul's going through the upper coasts of Ephesus, finds disciples of John the Baptist, and he asked them if they've received the Holy Ghost. He said, we've never heard about this. And so <clears throat> Paul answers and says, uh, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people to believe on him that comes after him, which is Christ Jesus. So when these disciples of John the Baptist heard this, they were immediately baptized, it says here, in the name of the Lord Jesus. So we see here that, um, you know, we look at the book of Acts, the beginning of the church. How did the people at the beginning of the church uh, instruct new believers in Jesus to be baptized? It's commonly agreed the book of Acts immersed people in water, and it's also commonly agreed that the only name spoken in that water baptism in the church, in the book of Acts, which is found in the Bible, it was in the name of Jesus. So how did the early church interpret Christ's command of Matthew 28, 19? They did it in the name of Jesus. There's also uh, some uh, scholarly and historical sources that would back this up. The Encyclopedia of Religion and Ethics on page 384 and 389, it says the formula was used, which is this, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ or some synonymous phrase. Interpreter's Dictionary of the Bible, uh, page 351 of volume one, says the evidence suggests that baptism in early Christianity, early Christianity, another way you could say that is at the beginning of Christianity. When it was administered, it was not in the threefold name, but in the name of Jesus Christ or in the name of the Lord Jesus. Hastings Dictionary of the Bible, volume one, page 241, says one could conclude that the original form of words was this, into the name of Jesus Christ, or the Lord Jesus. The new uh, Schaff Herzog Encyclopedia of Religious Knowledge, volume one, page 435, it says this, and I like how it says this. The New Testament knows only baptism in the name of Jesus. And then Canny's Encyclopedia of Religions, page 53, Persons were baptized at first, or another synonym for that, it would be at the beginning, in the name of Jesus Christ, or in the name of the Lord Jesus. It's obvious. It's in there. We, this shouldn't even be a debate 2,000 years later. This shouldn't even be something that there is division about. It's in this book, and it's plain, and it's obvious, and it should be one of the most motivational reasons why the people of God should share the good news of Jesus with everyone in their cities and communities because it's only through the name of Jesus that anyone and everyone can be saved. And it's in baptism in the name of the Lord Jesus where remission of sins takes place, where the blood is applied, where the record that would condemn us to hell is completely eradicated and expunged. So baptism is a big deal, and baptism in the right method is a big deal because it matters how you start. And these basic foundational truths are things that cannot be tampered with. You and I would get very upset if some stranger came around our house and started digging holes around our foundation and taking a sledgehammer and trying to beat the slab of the house, of, of our house that's built upon this foundation. We get really upset about that. Don't mess with the foundation. Why well, say that to you today? Don't mess with the foundation of the basic biblical truths of Scripture that have power in them. The Bible says what it says, and it's commonly agreed, both historically, scholarly, and most important, scripturally, that at the beginning, the church baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And as I uh, 
come to a, a close here tonight, I want to talk about one other thing briefly, and that would be speaking in tongues as the initial sign of Holy Ghost infilling. We read in Acts chapter 2, that the day of Pentecost, when it was fully come, there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, filled the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And then we know, reading through, that there were people in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and they began to hear about this. They, um, not just the fact that they heard them speak with tongues, but they heard about it as well. And uh, some come and they hear this and they're confused and confounded because, yes, they are hearing um, their own language being spoken supernaturally. And they were all amazed and marveled. Are not all these that speak Galileans? We're hearing people, though, speak in our own tongue from all these different uh, nations represented, were hearing them speak the wonderful works of God. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying, what does this mean? And then others mocking said, these men are full of new wine. So what we find here in this account, the beginning, the initial moment, the at the beginning, at the first, the first outpouring of the Spirit of God, there were those who marveled, and there were those who mocked. And I'll say it today, 2,000 years later, the Holy Ghost is still being poured out, and there are still those who marvel, and there are still those who mock. Nothing's changed. It's still the same. And so Peter, verse 14, standing up with the 11, lifts up his voice and says, listen here, uh, I'm paraphrasing, of course, uh, be it known to you, listen to my words, these are not drunk. He's calling out the mockers. These are not drunk, as you suppose. Drunkenness, they're insinuating, oh, they're just babbling, nonsense. No, it's a supernatural witness of the infilling of the Spirit of God. They're not drunk, as you suppose. It's the third hour of the day. He said, but this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. And he quotes Joel, which we find in Joel chapter 2. In the last days, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh. Peter says that this moment, this experience that you are witnessing is what Joel prophesied about. But Joel chapter 2 does not say that they would speak with tongues. But Peter says this here that you are witnessing this is what Joel was prophesying about. This is also what Jesus said to wait for in Jerusalem. Wait till you're endued with power from on high. Wait for the promise of the Father. Those are all synonymous for the infilling of the Holy Ghost. And Peter also says in Acts 2.39, after he's preaching uh, to that group that we read about in Acts 2, he also says that this promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. It's for anyone and everyone. Acts 8, 14 through 19, we read in this account, uh, Philip in Samaria, and he goes on, and uh, the Holy Ghost had not fallen upon those, yet they were just baptized. But Peter and John come down, and um, we read that they prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. Verse 17, it says, Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Verse 18, Simon, a sorcerer, uh, sees this, and he, it says that when he saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. Now, I ask you, we, we, verse 18 specifically says Simon saw something, that when they laid hands on them, they received the Holy Ghost. Well, what precedent do we have in the book of Acts, which is a historical account that teaches theological truths? What other account do we have in Acts that there would be a visible sign? Well, the upper room, 
There could be cloven tongues of fire sit upon them. They were also speaking in tongues. So we can deduce that Simon saw something because scripture says so. And we continue to read Acts 10, 10, 44 through 47, Peter's preaching to Cornelius' house. And it says, while he's preaching, while he spake these words, the Holy Ghost fell on them, which heard the word. They of the circumcision, meaning the Jews, which believed uh, Jewish Christians, they were astonished because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. Because it says, for they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Here it is again, the second time it's recorded. I know there's different explanations for why it was just supposed to be this way in the book of Acts, but uh, we won't get to that right now. It's just this fact. It's face value. It says what it says. The common sign uh, is tongues. And then Peter says, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which have received the Holy Ghost as well as we? Acts eleven fifteen through 18, Peter's recounting uh, this uh, story um, to uh, some other elders in the church as they meet to discuss, can Gentiles be a part of the church? And he says in verse 15, as I began to speak, the Holy Ghost fell on them as on us at the beginning. Don't overlook that. He says, the Holy Ghost fell on them just like it did on us at the beginning. And then I remembered the word of the Lord, how that he said, John indeed baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost. For as much then as God gave them the light gift as he did unto us who believed on the Lord Jesus, what was I that I could withstand God? So Peter here, in his recounting of what happened in Cornelius' house, he said, the Holy Ghost fell on them just like it did us when? At the beginning. I went back to the beginning and I realized the same experience we had at the beginning, they're now having, which happened years after Acts 2. And then... As I connected the dots of Acts 2 and Acts 10 or when we experienced it at the beginning and how they experienced it, I remembered what Jesus said, that he will baptize us with the Holy Ghost. And Peter's putting the pieces together. This is the initial sign. This is the witness that a person has been baptized with the Holy Ghost. And so... When the elders in Acts 11 hear this, it says, when they heard this, in verse 18, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. And how did they all come to this conclusion? When they realized they received it the same way we received it. In Acts 19, it's the same account. Paul says, if you receive the Holy Ghost, we haven't heard about it. How were you baptized? They tell him, he says, you need to be baptized in the name of Jesus. They are baptized in the name of Jesus. Then Paul lays his hands on them and it says they received the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost came on them and they spake with tongues. Three different accounts in Acts that I've mentioned. When the Holy Ghost comes on them, they spoke with tongues. Well, there's a principle in Scripture. In the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established. So Luke, the author of Acts, is giving an historical account that teaches theological truths, and he makes sure that at least three times it is accounted for that when the Holy Ghost comes on somebody, they'll speak with tongues. And it's still happening today. It's still happening today. Anybody and everyone should and can receive the Holy Ghost. And don't try to come at it from determining what you should and shouldn't experience when you're hearing from somebody who has the same experience that is found in Scripture. Everything I've experienced in my relationship with God, I can find it in this book. And so... Uh, I, I close with this. 
When critics say, uh, th this is a statement by uh, David Bernard, when critics say we are weak, our worship is ridiculous, and our work is meaningless, the best answer is to build the church, to baptize people in the name of Jesus Christ, and to pray for people to receive the Holy Ghost. And that would be my anthem that I would decree to you this year. No matter what's going on in the world, no matter what people may say about us, no matter what uh, others may think, no matter what other Christian um, uh, groups may think and say about us, let's just keep doing the work of God. Let's just keep reaching for people. Let's just keep baptizing people in the name of Jesus Christ and praying for people to receive the Holy Ghost because it still happens and we can trace our beliefs, our practices, and our experience all the way back to the beginning. Not some creed that was formed 300 years after Jesus ascended into heaven. We can trace it all the way back to this book and that is the apostolic approach. Go back to the beginning and make sure that what we're a part of can be found 100% in this book. So, as we launch into this new year, let's give it everything we got and keep preaching the truth of Jesus to the world and see multitudes of people's lives transformed. God bless you.